get started in just a minute. Welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. 8.01, starting right on time. I know we'll have people continuing to trickle in, but thank you all for being here uh, for this kickoff webinar session for uh, our new webinar series that we're just launching today. My name is Ryan Fincham, and I'll be your moderator for the session today. Um, and I'd just like to welcome you all and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm the co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University and one of the organizers of this webinar series along with my colleagues uh, Jim Barbarak and Aaron Hicks also from our center and with our colleagues from the U.S. Forest Service International Programs. Let me first provide you all with a brief overview of this webinar series, and then we'll quickly get into the topic that's brought you all here today, uh, tourism in protected areas, and of course, our conversation with our amazing uh, group of specialists, panelists that are gonna be joining us today. So we thank them in advance for, for being here as well. So this 2020-2021 uh, bilingual two-part webinar series will be focused on global protected area issues and is entitled Protected Areas for All. It's being organized by the Center for Protected Area Management at CSU and the U.S. Forest Service International Programs. Part one, which is gonna take place starting today through October, will be focused on building resilience. And we'll be focusing on topics such as tourism in protected areas, financial resilience, and the evolving role of the park ranger or the ranger. Uh, part two will be focused on equity and inclusion. It will take place from February to April of 2021. It will include topics such as leadership, equity, and accessibility. Our overall purpose for this webinar series is to ensure that we have a space to share and to connect during these trying and difficult times. I, I'm sure we're all you know, tired of hearing those words, but the situation is what the situation is. And uh, these webinars will be pr presented basically as a, as a conversation, conservation conversation, if you will, um, instead of a formal presentation. Um, the idea is to provide a space to exchange um, information and good ideas, and hopefully help us start to slowly reimagine uh, how we can return, not to normal, but to better once this pandemic has passed us. Ensuring that protected areas are better conserved, managers are better equipped and connected, and our protected areas better serve all people. It's our hope that this webinar series will contribute in some small but meaningful way to these big uh, lofty goals. So there's 12 webinars altogether, six in Spanish, six in English, and we invite you to stay tuned through our website and Facebook page and register for any of these sessions that you're interested in attending. We'll be broadcasting them both through Zoom, as uh, many of you are already here joining us, and also through Facebook Live. So we should be able to accommodate uh, all the interest that people have in, in attending. I see that uh, we're starting to get quite a few people joining us up. So uh, let me just say to our participants, thank you for being here and for joining us. I realize there are so many webinars going on right now, and we appreciate you taking the time to share this uh, space with us. Um, as you log in, we'd like to ask you to take just a second to uh, use the chat function, as I see many of you all already are, to let us know, continue to let us know um, where you're joining us from. And um, if you would, also tell us something that you're hopeful for. I know sometimes hope can be in limited supply but it's so critical in challenging times like these. So sharing our hope perhaps can also inspire others that might be struggling or having just one of those weeks. So in addition to sharing with us where you're from, if you have something that you're hopeful for, please share that as well. 
as we get started with our panelists, if you have specific questions for our panelists as the conversation starts, we're going to invite you to use the Zoom question and answer function specifically for your questions rather than the chat. This will be the easiest way for us to track the questions and make sure that we're able to get as many of the answers back to you. Hopefully we'll get to some of those questions today. And for the questions that we can't get today, we'll get to them in the future and then post those questions and answers to our website along with a recording um, of this session here today. Jim Barbarak is joining us and will be monitoring those questions. And so uh, he'll be coming in and joining us later with, with some of those questions from you all for our panelists. And Erin Hicks is gonna be providing technical support. So feel free to reach out to her uh, through the chat function if you have any technical issues or if something's not working properly. And just as a, a heads up, we are gonna keep this uh, to 60 minutes in length. So hang with us as we, uh, as we start to get going here. So let's go ahead and get started uh, talking about tourism and protected areas. I imagine uh, many of you are joining us that are working on protected areas, are working on supporting communities that rely on tourism for their livelihoods. And uh, because of that, we've got an amazing group of panelists that we've invited from North America, South America, and Africa to chat with us about their experience during the pandemic and also hopefully share with us what they're looking forward to beyond 2020. I think the uh, New Year's Eve celebrations at the end of 2020 were going to be quite spectacular in, in hopes of, uh, of a better 2021. Um, I'll present all the panelists now and then give them a chance afterwards to each provide us with a brief overview of their current work. Um, I'd invite them to tell us about their, their normal job, but and also feel free to add in how this pandemic perhaps has altered um, kind of your day to day. So we're going to be joined today by Toby Bloom, National Program Manager for Travel, Tourism, and Interpretation with the U.S. Forest Service, with Sue Snyman, Research Director for the School of Wildlife Conservation at the African Leadership University, and Thiago Beraldo, the Knowledge Development Coordinator for the Tourism and Protected Areas Specialist Group of IUCN. So welcome to all three of you. Thank you for taking your time to be with us today. And I'll now turn it over to Toby for her to provide us with her introduction. Hi, everyone. It's really exciting to see uh, a lot of names that I know in the chat box. Hi to all those friends out there that I know and friends that I don't know. Um, it's been an interesting five or six months, I'll have to say. When all of this first started, I was actually on a temporary assignment as the Director of Recreation for Arizona and New Mexico uh, for the Forest Service. And so it was super interesting um, to try and build the plane while we were flying it, figuring out where it was okay to have folks and where it was not. Because the Forest Service, all of our units stayed open through the entire pandemic. We had specific developed recreation sites that were closed, but how to get the messages out about where you could be safely, how to social distance, and all of the new visitors that we have now to public lands as we are seeing more and more people coming outside. How do we get those folks up to speed on what the etiquette is normally in a protected area or a public lands, and then also with this new layer of protection that we all wanna to give to each other. So that's what I've been working on. Also, our visitor centers shut down uh, for a long time, and so getting those, some of those back open, or at least having a plan for what that will look like, that's been a lot of the work I've been doing. And on the tourism side, um, it's been very interesting to see uh, hyper-local tourism is really blossoming right now. And so working with our gateway communities to make sure that if First of all, if they want visitors, um, it's highly dependent on the location right now about whether it's a good idea to have visitors or whether local communities are trying to keep the numbers down in order to protect um, their health infrastructure. And so I think we've all had to become uh, a little bit of health experts. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we're all working on community outreach right now because everything is hyper-local. And of course, um, working on uh, issues of systemic racism, which is something that we've always um, been trying to address when it comes to public land, specifically in the United States. But it's been very interesting to have all of these really huge topics come to a head at the same time and to see how they all overlap. And indeed, I think 
you know, nobody would have signed up for what we're going through right now, but it has been such an interesting way to peel back um, the, the top layer of what we've all seen and really get into the nitty gritty of how do we make sure that everybody can get outside equitably, especially in a time where that's where we all pretty much need to be. You're either outside or you're in your house. So that's about it for me. I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Toby. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, let's go to Sue now. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. It's yeah, very exciting, as Toby said, to just see all the different countries. It's a real diverse um, group of people joining us. Um, so I'm currently working for the African Leadership University, which is based and the School of Wildlife Conservation. So the school is based in Rwanda, in Kigali, but I'm actually still in South Africa at the moment because we are still not allowed to travel um, out of the country yet. Um, pri prior to joining the um, African Leadership University, I was in the private sector for about 20 years working in private sector tourism in protected areas and specifically looking at how to engage communities um, in tourism. And right now my focus is, act, is on a state of the wildlife economy in Africa report. And we started the whole process for the report prior to COVID. And the idea with the report was to see how to diversify the wildlife economy so that um, governments and communities weren't so dependent on tourism. And so COVID has really obviously highlighted that hugely in every way. Um, I, someone used the analogy the other day of, um, you know, tourism being the water coming out of the tap and someone has just turned off the tap. And um, I think for me, the most exciting thing, if you can call it that, is the realization and everyone's seen how far that water went. Because I think everyone who works in tourism is very aware of the multiplier effects, the value chains. Um, but certainly a lot of governments in Africa, I don't think, realized how huge that impact was and how important those protected areas and the assets of the wildlife in those protected areas are for the tourism and for all those value chains. So um, my work at the moment has been focused on trying to look at the tourism in protected areas in Africa, but then also how do we diversify that um, wildlife economy so that um, not when, uh, not if, but when something like this happens again, yeah, we are more resilient and ready for it. So diversifying into things like non-timber forest products, um, which can be, uh, local, national, regional, and international. So they can have different markets, um, things like hunting, um, both for meat and for trophies. Um, also carbon market, um, obviously quite new and innovative. And, you know, how do we capture that? Um, what we've seen so far in Africa is the properties that are surviving are those who have already diversified. So they have a tourism product, they have some real estate, they have a carbon project, they have a honey project. And so they weren't as you know, hard hit by um, COVID and the, the stoppage of tourism. Uh, so in terms of the university, everything is online as with all universities and all everything. And um, the Rwandan government has closed the universities till the end of the year. So we will be online from the start of our new term in September. So we've all become very used to um, all of these as everyone has. Um, but I must say, it's been very exciting to see how the university has just put everything online, all courses, um, and just how people have come together and the technological innovation for me has been really exciting. And I think, um, as you mentioned, Toby, like none of us want to be here, but I think we needed to reset, like reevaluate and just start a new path. And, and so for me, it is quite an exciting time, um, despite all the challenges. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Sue. Thiago. Um, hello, every, everybody. I'm really excited to be participating in this webinar. Um, Many, many important people um, speaking and a lot of the people that I see uh, as participants are really, uh, really um, important to the tourism sector and protected areas. So um, I work to the TAPAS group, Tourism and Protected Areas, uh, right now as Knowledge De Development Coordinator. And I, was, I also worked to the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation in Brazil. It's the federal agency that manages protected areas. Um, I worked to, with ICMBio since 2002. And I, uh, I served ICMBio as National Vice Coordinator of Concessions and National Coordinator of Ecotourism and other different roles. Um, and to uh, start my introduction, I would like to say some data that I've been working on related to visitors monitoring and economic impacts that are, that are occurring in Brazil right now. So in Brazil, we manage a system of 334 federal protected areas. In 2019, 
137 of them reported a total of 50 million visits. We had 50 million visits in 2019. In 2020, all protected areas were officially closed from tourists since March 17th. Few of them were reopened on July and some in August. Right now, we have only 13 protected areas open. Considering the average monthly variation, it is possible to predict that we stopped receiving around 5 million visits from March to August. Considering the actual, actual sanitary recommendations, we will lose other 2 million visits along the rest of the year, resulting in a total visitation uh, of 7 to 8 million visits in 2020 around 50% of the visitation we had in 2019. Um, taking into account the economic impact analysis that we did in, in, with protected areas in 2018, this reduction will generate a loss of $1.6 billion in total sales for all the business that work directly and indirectly with tourism in the regions of the protected areas. Besides 55,000 less jobs, permanent and temporary, uh, $410 million less in income from, for employees and business owners, and $575 million less value, total value for the GDP of Brazil. Um, so this is uh, how, how uh, in, uh, COVID-19 is impacting uh, the system of protected areas in Brazil right now. Thank you, Thiago, for that, uh, for that update. Um, I think one of the things we've been seeing is, is very different approaches around the world in terms of how protected areas uh, are handled during the pandemic. With, in some cases, as Toby mentioned, uh, the Forest Service units never closed. Um, and in fact, in the, U in the US, we saw many municipal, state, and federal areas at multiple levels remained open. Um, that provided lots of opportunities for outdoor recreation and mental health, but also provided some additional challenges, especially to the managers there. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from Toby a little bit about uh, how that went, uh, so a little more detail about some of the challenges that you're facing, um, you know, some of the pros and cons to, to, to staying open throughout the pandemic. And then we might go to Sue and Tiago to hear about, uh, you know, some of the challenges and opportunities with closing. Great, thanks, Ryan. Well, I think initially the hardest part about staying open was that this was a huge unknown and we knew people were getting sick and dying and we needed to protect our staff as well. And so even though we knew it was important to stay open, we shut down a lot of our developed recreation sites where we had a lot of our staff and we tried to figure out, you know, we started providing virtual services. But again, you know, it was one of those things where it's something that the agency has been talking about for a long time, which is a digital strategy and virtual services and things like that. And so it sort of was a forced moment of confrontation where we really just had to come up to speed on how are we gonna provide the most services that we can and create the least exposure for our employees and for the public. And so Thankfully, the Forest Service is really um, a science-based organization. And so from the very beginning, we had the advantage of um, our fire crews and all of the folks that manage fire, whose number one tool for decision-making is a risk assessment. And so from the very beginning, we were using risk assessments to decide which facilities stayed open, which facilities closed, how many people we needed to have available for certain things, we also have our own law enforcement and so it was made it a lot easier for us to be able to work directly with law enforcement and um, you know using a scientific approach to how we were going to determine what stayed open and what stayed closed um, so that made it easier for us the fact that we uh, as an organization always take a scientific approach of course you know being a federal agency we're also impacted by politics and because we work very closely with the states, uh, it was challenging because a lot of the ideals and the objectives that we had perhaps didn't line up uh, with the states that we were working with. And so it was very interesting for me uh, working with the state of Arizona and the state of New Mexico. Uh, for Americans, they probably already know, and, and other folks around the world, those are two states with extremely different politics. 
And so managing federal land um, under the filter of also what was going on at the state um, government level was such an interesting um, give and take and was very different depending on which state you were dealing with. So those were the challenges, but what we have also seen is kind of this national awakening to what it means to be outside and to have those places for all of us to be able to go outside. So for me, that has been um, the biggest uh, pro is that, you know, for better or for worse, everybody has become an outdoor enthusiast in this country. If you want to recreate and you want to relax, you pretty much, you know, unless you have a whole bunch of land that you own, you're going to public lands to get your time outside to go for a walk. Even where I live in Washington, D.C., um, we have large traffic circles uh, that are kind of like parks. And those parks, when I walk my dog every morning, I'm seeing, you know, maybe five or six times the people that I used to see in the park now. And so I think that um, nationally, this sort of um, whole national recognition of the importance of having places for people to go and this remembering of uh, that American spirit of outdoors. And hopefully, while we're kind of having those traditional thoughts, evolving the way that we look at these things and making sure that our public lands are serving all of our diverse populations and not just the people who created it, you know, 100 years ago, uh, which was a very small range of demographics uh, in this country. So sort of, relying on this new revelation of everybody being outside and trying to create some um, some equity, uh, making sure everybody has access. So there's been a lot of different moving parts going on, some good and some challenging. Thanks, Toby. Mm -hmm. um, Sue, you, you mentioned um, both your work with the private sector uh, previously, as well as a lot of your work that looks at uh, local communities that are involved in, in tourism. And so I'm kind of curious with uh, many of uh, parks in Africa closing down and the impact that that had to uh, both the private sector and local communities. Um, what, what's, what's going on there? How, how, how have those communities um, just gotten through? You know, like what, what, what are, and some, and the companies as well, what are, what's some of the impact that's going on? And are, are you seeing some of that um, bouncing back as protected areas or protected areas opening back in, back up in your region of the world or, or still things fairly closed? What's the situation looking like? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, I mean, the impact has been huge. Uh, and I, I'm sure as it is in other parts of the world, and certainly in South America as well, a lot of the protected areas, the funding for the conservation side comes from the tourism. And obviously, a lot of the um, communities, because of the remoteness of the communities, the only income they're getting is from the tourism. So that, you know, closing of the tourism has had a massive impact. In terms of positives, I think, what we've seen is a huge coming together of private sector, of NGOs, of communities to try and support one another. And um, a lot of it has been um, direct aid. So a lot of the private sector tourism companies um, using uh, guest donations. So connecting with their networks to try and raise funds for mostly food aid at the moment and food parcels just to literally feed communities. I mean, as an example in Kenya, the conservancy, so the community model of land there, um, they're losing up to about or more than five million US dollars at the moment in terms of lease fees and concession fees that would normally go directly to those communities. And I think the most important thing um, has been the loss of jobs, really. And a lot of tourism companies have tried to maintain jobs and cut salaries, you know, have salary cuts. But obviously, there's, you know, we didn't know how long this was going to go on for. So it was sort of um, the cut, salary cuts were a few months and now trying to see what's going to happen with you know, some predictions, certainly for South Africa, the tourism or international tourism only sort of next year, March, April, um, that's a long time to be paying salaries without, um, you know, any incoming income. So I think it's also created a lot of innovation and creativity. So a lot of the private sector lodges, you know, an example, Old Pajeta in Kenya has started a fund called Art of Survival, um, where it's a, actually an art competition where you can enter and you will win a, a trip to Alpojeta fully paid once everything is back open. So it's a great way to draw people to you and create funds and you, you pay to enter. So they're raising funds um, to keep the community going. They're actually one of the examples where they have diversified. And so they've always been very creative in terms of um, what they're doing um, to manage the funds. Um, 
but certainly a lot of what's also happened is quite a lot of the private sector lease arrangements have always had a set minimum fee, a lease fee. So the communities uh, are still getting that. For example, the Makuleki community in South Africa, which is an, a land claim in the Kruger National Park. Um, after apartheid in South Africa, the community claimed the land back and they um, retained it in tourism. And the operators there pay a minimum lease fee, which they're still paying through this COVID time. But obviously they're not getting the revenue share. So there is a drop. And I know certainly that community is trying to look at ways you know, to build resilience, how they're going to diversify income uh, in the communities going forward. Um, I think it has created, uh, yeah, certainly a lot of innovation and um, the sofa safaris that uh, are everywhere. So people doing these online where you can sit. I know Rwanda is looking at a way to going forward even um, because you're only allowed one hour with the gorillas per day. So it obviously limits the number of people who can access the gorillas. Um, to have this gorilla safari that will be online. So you can actually sit in, in the United States or South America, you'll be able to go and watch some of the gorilla groups and to raise money through that. So I think a lot of these channels that were maybe quite obvious in the past weren't needed, but now there's this innovation of trying to figure out how do we create other income streams? And also, um, yeah, very much as you said, Toby, I think that connection of humans to nature has never been you know, sort of clearer in many ways. Um, from the conservation point of view to prevent future pan pandemics, but also from that, you know, connection for, you know, spiritual or emotional or mental reasons. And so a lot of the parks have opened up. Um, so Tanzania is fully open. Um, Kenya has opened up s some areas of the parks. And it's also been a, a great um, awakening in terms of domestic tourism and the importance of that. Because a lot of African countries have just focused on international tourism, international markets with international prices. And so, you know, now they're realizing how important that domestic market is and how you need to, you know, have um, products for that. You have to have price ranges for that. And so there's a lot of sort of creativity going on. So Rwanda, you would normally pay 1,500 US dollars to visit the gorillas um, for international tourists they, or any tourists, sorry. Um, and now they've cut it. I think, I, don't wanna, I think it's about 250 US dollars for um, nationals to go and see the gorillas. So you suddenly have a whole lot of um, local Rwandans having the ability now to go and see the gorillas, which they wouldn't have in the past. So raising conservation awareness as well. So and linking people more to the parks. So yeah, I think that creativity and innovation is, is really um, been a, a, a good opportunity for us. Great. Thanks, Sue. I really like the, that those uh, comments from both Toby and Sue about using this pandemic as an opportunity to, to reflect within our own systems and making sure that that the protected areas are more accessible to, to, to all within our, within our countries um, and, and reoriented some of that, uh, the tourism and visitation that it's not just about international arrivals. While we know those dollars coming from abroad are important, that these protected areas first and foremost should serve the populations of these countries that um, in one roundabout way are paying for them through their own taxes and, 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 and whatnot. Um, Thiago, you mentioned, um, that there's only 13 protected areas in Brazil that have that have now been reopened uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I'm curious if you could provide us with some additional information about how it's going for those protected areas. How have they reopened? Are there specific uh, health or, or good practices uh, for sanitation that they're utilizing to be able to reopen? Um, and how is that how is that working out? Um, well. Um... In Brazil, we have the, the situation that um, the decision to reopen the parks or the protected areas are to the local level. So the protected areas managers, they have to discuss this with the uh, uh, municipalities, to so the cities. When the city decides to reopen for the public services, then the parks can reopen for, the, for visitation. So this is why we just have uh, 13 of them uh, reopened so far. And um, we are working to them with the sanitary recommendations and those are mostly the same that we have all over the, the world. So use masks, use alcohol, uh, stay away from other people, keep the distance. Um, and uh, we also are discussing a lot with concessionaires, strategies to bring people back. The, some of the most important parks we have in Brazil, Tijuca in Rio de Janeiro, where we have the, the Christ the Redeemer and also Iguazu, where we have the uh, Cataratas Iguazu, Iguazu Falls. Iguazu Falls. So those parks, we have concessionaires and then we're discussing to them 
for example, disc uh, discounts for local for low season for locals in Rio in Rio de Janeiro. We are having a lot of locals coming back to uh, in the in the park. It's a it's a city park, so many people do uh, uh, ac recreation activities in the park. So the reopening of the area was really important. People were, were really demanding to to come back to the area. We are also opening some areas in the Amazon, for example, in the in the lower uh, Negro River is a, is a one arm of the, the Amazon River. We have uh, Anavillanas and Jaú National Parks. They are reopening for visitation right now. And they are, um, this, they decided to have 50% of the capacity in the, uh, in the tours because people are, are together in the tours. People are, are going close to some areas, uh, riding boats together. So they are putting, uh, the tours are, allowed to have 50% of the, the, uh, the, the, in the size of the groups. And some works, uh, some uh, uh, walks that they do, like uh, getting uh, uh, get contact with the pinky dolphins, for example, that is it's really, people like to do that in the Amazon. So right now they can go to the, the, the areas to see the dolphins, but they are not allowed to get in the water with the dolphins. So during this period of time, People will be allowed to see the dolphins, see the, the guys feed the dolphins, but they will not be allowed to get in the water. This is some example that the, the communities are doing to, to bring tourists back because they, they want the tourists, but they, they are also afraid of the tourists. Principally those communities, the remote communities in the Amazon, in other parts of the Brazil, indigenous peoples also who work with tourists. So, what we are working with them also is that uh, all reopening tourism uh, needs to have consensus from the community if they want to, to reopen and how they want to, to receive the tourism back. This is has been really important in the discussions of how to, to, to reopen. Well, we are also improving guides protocols in, in different parks as for example, Chapada dos Viadeiros uh, National Park uh, protocols that the guides should follow to bring the, the groups back to the parks and also improving first aid kits. This is really important with some other uh, uh, instruments that are key for, for uh, uh, keeping safe from COVID. And also the thing that I think is really important is visual aids because sometimes the mask, take off the mask, put the mask so as much as we can provide visual alerts for the people, uh, for the visitation, it's good to remind them that they have to keep those, those uh, distance behavior and uh, the safety protocols. Thanks, Tiago, for sharing some of those details from, from different areas around Brazil. And I think, you know, this idea of uh, uh, opening back up tourism and ensuring that it's opening with um, not not only the tourism the, the the community's consent, but with the on the community's terms is so critically important. And, and I, you know it's one of those principles, uh, foundational principles for ecotourism that sometimes gets forgotten as tourism drivers uh, uh, oftentimes uh, supersede uh, the, what, what a community wants. And so making sure that that reopening takes place, that the community is in the position to determine whether or not and when and how that tourism comes back is so important. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I have a question that I'd like to direct to all of you. Um, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a term that we're hearing a lot right now in the United States uh, as we're right in the middle of our big political season and everybody's talking about building back better. And uh, this actually is a term that's been taken over by U.S. politicians right now, but it actually was originally described as a United Nations term for a, a disaster risk reduction program. Um, but uh, now we're hearing all the politicians talking about building back better um, and thinking about that phrase and, and the hope that many people have that we won't simply go back to normal, but go back to something better. Use, really use this time of uh, home quarantine and reflection to think about how we can do things better. Uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, for each, from each of you, what, and you've already alluded to some of these things, so, but, but what, are, what are some of the things that might come back better as we come out of the pandemic and we look towards uh, tourism and protected areas beyond 2020, what are you hopeful for that's gonna come back better? Toby? 
Well, I mean, I think it's still building back better dealt with, um, you know, rebuilding after disasters. And I think, I mean, aren't we in that right now? And isn't it the perfect phrase for what we need to be doing? And frankly, if you're not thinking about how to do things differently so that we, you know, don't encounter, that we don't react, have to react this way again to a similar pandemic or other natural disaster, then you're missing the boat. Um, we can't go back to the way things were because we saw what the result was of how we're able to manage it. And so I think, and, and it's the entire world. So it's not a certain segment of population. It's not a certain country. Um, all of us need to think about being more resilient. I think, um, you know, climate change, people have started talking a lot more about climate change ever since this happened because now, you know, at least in the United States, they are predicting uh, two hurricanes to hit the southern coast of our country at the same time uh, in the next couple of days. And so looking at everything through a more careful lens of COVID, uh, I think what it has done is it has made it okay to talk about the difficult things because we have to talk about them. Uh, that's part of the reason why we're in the situation that we're in right now, where we're still having trouble getting out of this, was kind of the denial that this was going to impact all of us, and we all needed to be taking care of each other, and we all needed to be careful. So for me, I feel like building back better is exactly the kind of methodology that we need to be in. Um, for me, something that I saw throughout the pandemic was the um, renewed reliance on local supply chains. And so that's not just about tourism, but it is, I mean, you know, everybody was doing tourism locally. Go try to buy a bicycle right now. Um, nearly impossible. Um, go try to buy an RV. Uh, you can't buy an RV right now. Sales have gone up 400%. Um, if you can't do it locally right now, you're probably not doing it. Uh, shopping for groceries. We all heard in the United States there were large meat packing facilities that were shut down. And so all of this comes back to making sure that we have local supply chains. Also, you know, paying attention to how uh, a global crisis like this impacts people differently. Uh, and again, you know, I think that the, the George Floyd protests really brought that about, but it's no mistake that all of these things are coming about as we are all in a moment of reflection and our lives are all different and we're all having to question how we do things. Um, so that's what makes me hopeful, that we will, you know, continue to support local supply chains, support and rely on local businesses, uh, especially important right now in the tourism industry. All of our tourism industry took a major hit, um, you know, basically from March through June and are still facing a hit. As we're coming back, we're seeing ways that we can, um, you know, create kind of uh, varied versions of what used to be there, be it a restaurant or, you know, an outfitter that is providing tours. We're having to do things differently. And so, it has forced us all to think about how we're going to be different, and that is how we should be thinking. Um, boy, there's so much to this question. <laughs> I'm going to leave it for the other folks to to answer because I could probably go on about this one for another hour. So I'll leave. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Toby. I uh, really appreciate that. So Sue, we'll we'll go over to you now, and and thinking about this big back build back better, and 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 what are your thoughts uh, about what leaves you with hope? Yeah, I think I mentioned it um, briefly earlier, you know, this collaboration and partnerships. I think there's always been this sense of competition between the private sector, the NGOs, the communities, government, um, in terms of tourism in protected areas. You know, everyone thought that everyone else was doing better. You know, government thought the private sector was taking too much money, you know, and, and I think seeing everyone come together for the cause of, you know, COVID and um, certainly, uh, you know, anti-poaching efforts and trying to support communities, um, I hope that my hope is that there will be a sense of greater collaboration that we are all trying to achieve the same thing and you know the idea with this is to conserve nature through using tourism funding um, to conserve it so how do we you know work together to get the most for nature for people um, you know and work on that I mean I think safari or protected area tourism is designed for social distancing um, certainly in Africa 
um, you know, so I think in terms of re recovery, we, sh we are hoping that, you know, certainly from an African point of view, that people will want to come on safari, you know, and get out into nature and the wild or wherever it may be, you know, into forests and parks everywhere, um, because, you know, cities are where people are all crowded. So the parks allow for this social distancing. So we can carry on doing that for, for a long time. And I think an investment in conservation. So, um, you know, we, we often see conservation or protected areas as these closed off things that we're trying to protect desperately. And I think we need to have a total reset and look at them as an asset to the country in terms of the wildlife economy and what they can provide. And so we should invest in them as we would invest in any asset and try and grow them and, you know, not see them as the small thing that we're trying to protect desperately, because I think that mindset needs to change. We need to, you know, expand certainly in Africa, the transfrontier conservation areas, um, you know, are becoming a big thing, the man and biosphere reserves. So how do we, you know, make everything related to nature and open it up? And so I think those opportunities now and that connection, as I said, between people and parks um, is, is never been clearer. And so, yeah, I would be very sad if we didn't take this opportunity to reevaluate and reset. And, and also in terms of how we do business. I mean, we've all realized we can do everything online in terms of communicating and conferencing. So instead of spending millions on, 100 conferences a year use that money for conservation for tourism you know for communities um and you know meet as when necessary because i think that connection we all missing it and certainly in terms of the networking it's important but we don't need that you know i mean i think there were sort of like, i don't know how many conferences every year i just i know that i was going to a lot and i think you know that whole mindset change has been good in terms of and uh, as toby mentioned the climate change related to that you know the travel um so i think there are a lot of opportunities in this and i i think if we look at, um, you know, different business structures, you know, um, and structuring um, staffing models, everyone's had to be creative of how they do it. And so I think we can move forward very positively. And I, I do think protected area tourism is, is one of the key things that should be promoted. And yeah, I do hope that governments will invest more in it and so, or certainly in Africa um, and see the value. Thank you, Sue. Um, Tiago, what about, what about you? What, what, what makes you hopeful for, for tourism in, in protected areas in Brazil and, or around the world? Um, I have two, two points on, to say. Uh, first, thing, first thing, I think that we will, uh, people are, will be more willing to do um, low density activities. So we should focus more on protected area management zoning in offering better um, um, activities in remote areas, for example, um, and, and build trails. I know some countries, they have very nice trail system, but in, for example, in Brazil, we have to build more trails because uh, I think we, people will be willing to be more like alone, experiencing solitude than in crowded areas. Um, and many places in the wor world we are, uh, are facing over tourism. So I think that we will see a, a shift in people uh, looking for uh, more uh, more solitude activities. So uh, this is, uh, I think, something that we should uh, work to offer more uh, uh, wilderness experiences to, to visitors and also work in, uh, in those views in a way that we move people from one area to the other uh, using making uh, making them stay in smaller groups. We are doing this a lot. Uh, uh, planning this a lot in uh, in Tijuca with the uh, Tijuca National Park in Rio de Janeiro. And that people from the of the Christ in the top of the mountain. We are developing a series of a series of places. Like we may have lost Tiago uh, temporarily. Well, Sorry. There, you, there you. I think we lost you. We lost you just for a second, Tiago. But you're back. Okay. Okay. So in Tijuca, we're working to make people is, uh, go to see different areas instead of just going to see the Christ and coming back to the the bottom of the mountain. So we are spreading people around the park better than just uh, concentrating people in, in one small space. Um, and for, uh, for the hope question, I, I would say that uh, I see many conservationists saying that 
oh, now we see that how protected areas are depending on tourism. We should uh, find other ways to finance protected areas. I see a lot of conservationists looking in this perspective. And I hope that with this COVID, we also understand how important is tourism how important is this activity and I, I hope that more people understand that how uh, how tourism can and be uh, something that will help protected areas to to thrive conservation to help the communities to not the, um, deprive the areas uh, the natural resources so this is my hope for the future that we build awareness so how important tourism is for for protected areas thank you Thiago and um, <clears throat> Um, I think we're going to move here to questions from the audience. Um, I know, uh, unfortunately, Toby always had to go first. And so sometimes hope begets hope. And so maybe I think Toby has some new, uh, something else she'd like to mention in addition to her original comments. Yes. Yeah, so I talked about building back better, but I didn't really get to talk about what makes me hopeful. And I think in the United States right now, believe it or not, we have something that we can all be really hopeful about which was the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, which passed about two weeks ago. And that is a bill that is 100% about public lands. Half of the bill uh, provides billions of dollars with a B to, in, to repair our deferred maintenance backlog in all of our public lands. So our national parks, our national forests, um, wildlife reserves, basically any place that we have infrastructure, trails, visitor centers, picnic areas, campgrounds, billions of dollars were just signed into law to be used to, to reduce that um, deferred maintenance so that everything is back to the state where it can be so that a lot of people can use it. The other half of that bill was the permanent funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, which is such a fantastic idea. Basically what this is, is um, the gas and oil companies in our country that use the resources that are ours as American people. We own the gas and the oil uh, that's in our country. And so basically the Land and Water Conservation Fund says in exchange for you gas and oil companies using our resources, you need to put some of your money back into our green spaces in the country. And so it's always been a percentage of gas and oil drilling real, um, uh, royalties that go into that fund, but it has never been funded uh, fully at $900 million a year, which was the full amount that it could have been funded. I think the highest it had ever been funded was $450 million a year. And so this bill um, ensures that the Land and Water Conservation Fund will be funded at $900 million a year every year in perpetuity. And every single county in the United States benefits from that money. And so if you have a baseball field in your community that needs upgrading, or you want to turn like a little triangle of concrete into a park, that's what that money can be used for. In addition to obviously um, acquiring new lands to create uh, wildlife corridors, which is what we use the money for in Forest Service and you know, Park Service and the other land management agencies do those things as well. But I don't think it's any mistake that a sweeping bill that is probably the most landmark public lands bill, you know, in the last 50 years passed during COVID when we are all needing to be outside. And it is not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. It's a human issue. It's about our connection to being outside. And so this bill really demonstrated that everybody in the United States thinks that these things are important. It had bipartisan support and it passed uh, with really high numbers. And when you look at our political landscape in the country right now, these are really the, some of the only bills that are getting bipartisan support are the ones that are meant to support our public lands and our ability to enjoy the outdoors in the state. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. <laughs> And if you haven't read about it yet, I know there is a lot of other news, but Google Great American Outdoors Act uh, and learn about it because it's something you know that's really exciting for us and might change the landscape of recreation and tourism in the United States over the next five years and beyond. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Toby, for that positive news and uh, leaving us with hope that there's gonna be some financial resources to, uh, 
to help us continue to build back better. I'm going to now <clears throat> turn it over to Jim Barbarak and invite him to, uh, to join us on video. I know, Jim, you've been monitoring some of the questions from the audience. We only have about uh, nine minutes left for questions, but maybe we can get to one or two questions for the panelists. Um, so take it away, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and <clears throat> good day to all of you that are participating from around the world. It's great to see that we have over 200 people uh, here uh, listening in and others uh, on the uh, Facebook page as well. Uh, at first, I've put my own email address into the chat. If anyone has a burning question that we don't manage to get to, feel free to follow up with uh, anyone on our team. We'll be happy to try to, to get to those later. But we've had a, a lot of questions in the Q&A and some in the chat. And I'd say most of them have revolved around three issues. And I'd like to ask each of our panelists to take on one of these. The three issues are one, one has to do with funding for protected areas uh, and obviously funding for the communities that depend on them. There were a number of comments and questions about how do we reduce the dependency of protected areas on tourism, uh, which as we've seen with uh, this disease outbreak is, is fickle and can collapse overnight. So what can we do to reduce the, 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 the dependence on tourism or on one type or one segment of tourism also to diversify within tourism and beyond tourism the fund protected areas in ways like Toby just mentioned. Uh, a second had to do in more in general and with the impacts on communities and case studies of how communities are coping and what we can do to build resilience in communities that live in and around protected areas that to date have depended very much on, on tourism to diversify their economies and livelihoods. And the third has to do with the concern about opening up too fast and the impacts on staff impacts on local communities and also the impacts uh, of illegal activities and legal activities, both people uh, pivoting to poaching or illegal extraction due to the lack of income from tourism on the one hand uh, and uh, also from the potential impacts of having too many loving our areas to death, killing the goose that laid the golden egg as we say in English. So if each of you would like to address one of those three issues on funding protected areas, impacts on communities or impacts on resources, that would be great. I'll kick off um, on the community one. I think the first two were sort of related in a way, the funding and the community and how communities can benefit. I mean, I, I do think we need to be quite innovative in how we do it. Um, and the, I mean, protected areas before COVID were underfunded. Um, all over the world and specifically in Africa um, very much. So clearly what we have been doing is not working. So how, how do we, you know, even forgetting about COVID, how do we think about new things? I mean, there are some innovative things already. So like in Seychelles, um, they have been very creative in terms of how they fund in the uh, blue economy and the ocean um, conservation um, through a Seychelles sovereign blue bond, um, which has even now during COVID allowed them through this blue bond, which is an investment from three um, impact investors who invested into this bond, um, Seychelles gets 500,000 US dollars a year just for conservation. It has to be, it's tied to conservation. So they have had this income coming in um, without COVID. So I think we need to start thinking about more of these, you know, how do we get investors to um, invest and how do we all become environmental investors instead of conservationists? Let's, let's become investors in this asset. And so thinking of um, creative ways, and as I said earlier, the diversification um, in terms of the funding, you know, through different using natural resources, even now during COVID, some national parks in Africa have allowed communities um, sustainable use of um, wildlife in the parks um, and access to that uh, even Kruger National Park has a project um, where the community is allowed to go in and collect mapani worms, which has always been a very um, major protein source for communities. So how do we allow, um, you know, get that combination of sustainable use and access, um, allowing communities who have always traditionally accessed these areas, um, and obviously, you know, issues with population growth affect that. And so how do we manage that now in the, the new era um, through these creative ways and, and getting communities also to think of traditional creative ways of how they've managed, um, you know, resources in the past, like you're trying to use a lot of the indigenous knowledge um, that we have and ensuring that communities, you know, as I said, have access, but also are, have the capacity to engage in partnerships. So a lot of the time we have a tourism, you know, equity partnerships with the private sector, but there's nothing equitable about it because the communities don't have the capacity to engage or understand the tourism business model. And so, you know, building that capacity, I think is critical. 
Um, so sorry, I mixed up the two questions there a little bit, but I, I think they're very related um, uh, in terms of you know funding and how we go forward. Sure, T Toby or Tiago, would you like to uh, compliment uh, on Sue's comments there? Um, I'll add just real quick, I agree with Sue that the first two are related about funding and about, you know, how do we support communities and to that end, again, I don't think it's any coincidence. Um, the second version of a uh, resource guide, um, USDA is the US uh, Department of Agriculture and Forest Services under that department in the US, but we also have a sister agency called Rural Development. And that agency basically provides um, loan guarantees, grants, business services to rural communities in the United States. And um, at the beginning of 2017, I actually uh, initiated a partnership with our rural development agency so that we could put our communities in touch with money from rural development so that we could really create a stronger tourism network. Um, and so basically people are recreating on the national forest during the day. And then, you know, if they don't have a campground or they're not staying on the national forest, they're going out to our gateway communities. They need a place to sleep. They need a place to eat. Maybe there's a community ski lift that they're going to use that day because there aren't as many people there. Um, maybe they need to rent a bicycle or whatever it is. And so um, this partnership helps us uh, fund tourism in the communities, in our gateway communities. And I am going to post in the chat box um, the newest version of that resource guide that just became available. Uh, and then I will pass it on to Tiago. Um, well, uh, I, first, thing, first thing is that this is a global issue. Um, every segment is facing some challenges, and, but I think this is gonna pass. Yes, everybody thinks that right now this is going to pass. And um, the the protected areas are the best place for people to be, like yeah, obeying safety guards for health safety regulations. So we have dispersed areas; people can be in the areas. So we should be opening more the areas, not worried about COVID, but like putting people to to go to nature and and reconnect to nature. And also it's important to understand that tourism, tourism is not a one thing. There are different segments on tourism, different ways to do tourism. So, um, uh, and, and, and who, people who work to tourism, they know that they, 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 there is season. So everybody who works to tourism know that there is a, a, a good season that the people will make more money and, the, and then lower seasons where the communities, for example, they need to work to, uh, to have other different kinds of income. So this all can address this, this, this situation where uh, when, for example, there is this global issue and, and nobody can travel. So focus more on local people and uh, remote areas. We can bring people uh, with using diversification. For example, we are working in a remote areas with bird watchers, sports, uh, sport fishing. There are segments of tourism that are more willing to pay more to go to more to even remoter areas. And, and do tourism. So we need, we need to understand more the segment and understand more the industry of tourism. And there is not just one way to do tourism. We can put a lot of diversification and different publics, international, locals, and different ways to, to, making, to provide income to those, to those communities. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thiago. Thank you, Toby and Sue. Thanks for the questions coming from the participants as well. Um, it's been a great session. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start to bring this session to close. Uh, we understand everybody is extremely busy and it's important to make sure you guys can get on to um, the rest of the activities uh, that you have uh, for the day. So let me just uh, finalize by thanking our participants. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, I'm definitely leaving a little more inspired, a little more hopeful, and with some new, uh, some new ideas. So thank you very much as well. Um, just a reminder to everyone that's, uh, that's listening, uh, we're gonna continue this conversation. Um, this Thursday, we have our second session that's gonna be about uh, the same topic, but in Spanish. Um, you, Toby will be back and we'll have some additional speakers joining us from uh, from the Spanish speaking world. So uh, please tune into that. If, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, speak Spanish or if you want to practice your Espanol. 
Um, and then uh, the next series is going to hit on some of the topics that came up today, this idea of building financial resilience. And so uh, please keep your eye out for September 22nd and 23rd. Come back and join us. We'll be talking more about um, a whole wide variety of innovative uh, uh, finan financial mechanisms to help us strengthen our protected areas. So thanks to you all. Thanks again to the team at CSU and to the US Forest Service International Program so for, for supporting um, this initiative. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on, on, future, on future webinars. Big virtual hug. <laughs> and take care, everybody. <laughs> Stay safe. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Bye guys, thank you all.